It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It is the Jill on Money program, and we are so delighted that you are joining us today. We are broadcasting from the Capital One Virtual Studios, because we're not in a physical studio yet. Capital One, this is Banking Reimagined. What's in your wallet? Hey, I know. It's summer. You're hot. It's sweaty. There's a heat wave. There's a pandemic. There's anxiety. But we are here to hold your hands. I am in a great mood. Let me tell you why. Because my dog woke me up. She was snoring like crazy. And she woke me up. And I bounced up like 4.15 in the morning. Not kidding. And so, you know, I couldn't get back to sleep. So then I decided, I'll make myself a cup of coffee. Then by 4.45, Mark, I was on the bike doing a climb ride with one of my favorite Peloton instructors, Christine. 45 minutes, sweating my pants off ready to rock and roll. So you know what? I'm going to crash in a couple hours, but for right now, I'm all yours. We're here for you, especially if you are about to lose your extra $600 a week in unemployment benefits. Yes, it's July 31st. That's the deadline. But But because most state programs run through the Saturday or Sunday, that means that this is the weekend where things are going to start happening. So if you are going to lose your benefits, if you're worried, if you have friends, if you have kids, just reach out to us. Send us a note. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Okay, this is from Robin who writes, Hi, Jill and Mark. Jill, I went back to one of your book readings uh, held by Spoken Interludes, and you made personal finance approachable. Oh, how nice that is that? I remember doing that book event. It was up in like somewhere in upper Westchester County, New York, that is. I immediately went out and read your book and signed up for your newsletter. Back in March, my husband and I started listening to your podcast. We both enjoy and find them to be informative. On your June 22nd podcast, you mentioned that you could not contribute to a Roth IRA if you had unemployment earnings. If you have both wages and unemployment, would the unemployment be included in the uh, modified adjusted gross income limit of 196000 to 206000 threshold. Hmm. We're trying to estimate and see if we're able to contribute to a Roth and we're not comfortable with what is added and what is not. Background. We're married filing jointly. We're over 55. We both work. My husband is currently receiving unemployment. Here are the rough estimates for 2020. Wages, 100400 Unemployment, 22500 Interest, dividends, capital gains, 26500 which is what we, is really, they took it from their 2019 return. She says, think 2020 will be less, but we don't have a clue. Tax exempt interest, uh, doesn't matter. IRA rollover, my husband has one traditional IRA with a value of 55000 that we will roll over to a Roth by year end. We have the funds to pay the taxes in full. Okay, let's see. Is the rollover amount included while calculating adjusted gross income? Yeah, that is included, right, Mark? That's definitely included. So that's going to pop you up. So even just that, if you look at your 100,000 plus the rollover, that's your 155. That will definitely be included. Would we be better off not rolling over the full amount of my husband's IRA so that we would be able to make our 2020 Roth contributions of 7,000 each? Appreciate your help in figuring this all out. Okay, big picture. Let's see. I think that because of your ages and because you're actually planning to convert the IRA to a Roth IRA... I think that kind of will do it for you. And I guess I'm also wondering, what's up with your own retirement contributions? You said you're working. Are you 
currently putting money into your own retirement plan? Or are you both just doing Roth contributions? I'm not sure which. This is what I think. Is unemployment counted in this calculation? Mark, what's your guess? I'm guessing yes also. I don't know this for sure, but I think that it's a little bit of a double jeopardy for you, and I'm sorry to say that, um, and it works against you, meaning that, yeah, if you, it's not considered earned income when you want it to be, but it is uh, uh, included in your adjusted gross income when you, when you don't want it to be. So you can't just contribute to a Roth IRA counting unemployment as earnings, but the IRS does get it both ways because I think it is included in your adjusted gross income. That said, um, maybe we can get you to reduce your amount of money that you are earning simply by putting some money into a retirement account, or let's not freak out too much. And then maybe this year you skip it and just consider that this is the year that you won't do it. I think that you're in fine shape. I don't have a problem with you not doing it this year, but I think that all of that will be, will be actually included. So, all right, we'll see how it goes. Do write me back if you have some updates, perhaps about, um, you know, kind of what you're thinking about in terms of your options, right? If, you, if you've got a 401k or a 403b that's available, let me know. Okay, next question here is about retirement. Um, here's my question. This is from Suzanne. My husband recently retired. He has roughly $950,000 invested with Vanguard and his government thrift savings plan. I have $60,000 in Vanguard from my previous job. We've got no debt. And with my husband's pension and my salary, which is about twenty five grand a year, plus a little rental property, we have a total of around $5,000 a month. We live a modest life. Um, the rental property is worth one hundred twenty five grand. The house is $225,000. We also have a CD, $150,000. It matures in December. Our total of $5,000 a month covers everything, including our health care. Our rental property is worth about $125,000, our house $225,000. Okay, so I'm wondering, what do we do with the maturing CD? This is our emergency reserve fund. We have about $30,000 in our checking account. My husband says we should put it in a Roth as there is no value in the CD right now. All right, come on now. Here's the deal. You should keep one year of your expenses in the bank. So for you, you've got one, your, your year of expenses, $5,000 a month times 12 means that you need $60,000. So what I would do is I would consider putting another $30,000 in a, let's call it a higher yield checking savings account. And then you've got the rest of the money to deal with, right? So you've got another $120,000. Now, the thing is that with your salary, you could certainly put some money in a Roth IRA, but I don't know if you really need it. Sounds like you're in good shape. Suzanne goes on to write, we're in our early 60s, um, and my husband sees no reason to file for Social Security yet. That's true. Uh, should we both take Social Security early? No, you should not. You should wait till your full retirement age. And here's what I would do. If you're worried about this, even if it's crappy interest that it's going to pay, I don't care. I would still just go ahead and keep it safe. There's no reason to have all your money at risk. Okay, Oof, I'm coming up to a break, Mark says. So if you've got a financial question, give us a holler. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com or go to the website, jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. Welcome back. It's Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. If you're just joining us because you just tuned in, you missed my whole story about waking up early this morning, but I'm on fire. Let me just say that. Uh, I mentioned my own dog because I have two dogs. Um, I would encourage you all to go to our website, jillonmoney.com, where you can see our newest section of the website. It's very important to your financial life. I'm sure you'll agree. It's called the Furry Fan Club, meaning that 
everybody started writing and telling us, hey, I'm right walking my dogs and listening to the show and this, that, and the other thing. And so everyone started sending us dog pictures. Mark, did you get those cat pictures I sent you? That's my friend Vicky's cat. There's two or three of them. Who knows, you know? But I said I needed some cats. So I got them in because somebody somebody called me out for being an anti-catist. I'm just allergic. I'm not really anti-cat. It's just that, you know, I look at those pictures and my nose starts running. Anyway, are you a cat person, Mark? You're a dog person, but how do you feel about a cat? Not into cats. Okay. Well, you know what? Because we are, we don't understand the cat psyche. The cat psyche is a different kind of psyche. That's what I would say. Anyway, please, if you have a dog or a cat or a fish or a gerbil or whatever you want, send us an email and attach a photo. Right now, besides my own children, I have to say that golden retriever puppy, Mark, is that the most delicious? I mean, that is uh, Ken Griffey Jr., also known as Griffey or Griff. So um, send us your photos. Send us your email questions as well. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That's Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. This is from Anne Marie who writes, Hi, Jill. I was listening to your show and I thought maybe you could give me some advice. I have a savings account uh, in California and I am in Colorado. It has $70,000 in it, no real interest. Do you have any advice on what to do with it? I'll be 60 in September. I am not working. Anything I can do to earn more interest or something, thank you for your time, Anne-Marie. So this dovetails very nicely with our previous caller who has had a CD that was maturing. Yes, interest rates are at zero, okay? That just means you're going to have to work a little bit harder to find higher yielding accounts. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to depositaccounts.com. And there, it's a great site. It aggregates. It's um, I think it's owned by Lending Tree now. So it aggregates savings, CDs, checking, money markets, okay? Now, let me give you an example. You go to, say, a one-year CD, and you click on this thing, and instead of getting what some people are telling me was less than 1% sub you know, sort of 80 basis points, it looks like there's a bunch of different institutions offering one and a quarter percent. But I would also encourage you to look at the money market side of the of the site because there, you know, you might get a money market account or a good a savings account that gives you a little bit more um, in interest. And, and, you know, you could maybe get, let's say, 1% in interest. Here's one, you know, you just go here, you can see a bunch, there's more than 1% interest. So I think that if you go to depositaccounts.com, check that out. I know it's a little more work and it's a pain in the neck, but so, you know, for a little extra money, why not? Especially if you are the type of person who really doesn't want risk, or this is your emergency reserve fund. Both of those cases make a ton of sense and you know in the world of of well you know markets going crazy upside and you feel like you want to jump in don't necessarily jump on that bandwagon if you don't have experience and if you are uncomfortable with risk okay all right settling gang this is a long email from mike And he says, I recently read an article that said people born in 1960 will be getting a lower social security benefit due to lower average U.S. reported income in 2020. It said that social security aims to replace 40% of average income from the year you turn 60. I was born in 1960 and I'm turning 60 this year. Because of the high unemployment due to the coronavirus, they said expected average reported income will be significantly lower for 2020, perhaps 12 to 15 percent less than in 2019. Would you be able to confirm how benefit levels are calculated? Are people my age going to experience long term financial impact from the virus? Does Social Security use market conditions as part of the benefit calculations? Would Congress step in and adjust the average used for the calculation? Is there anything I can do? Mike says, I turned 60 this year. My wife recently turned 58. We've got zero debt. 
We own a home with a market value of $350,000. We pay everything with a credit card to get points and pay it off in full each month. I would like to retire sooner rather than later. I have some health issues that might reduce my longevity, although maybe not. I think the break-even point for taking Social Security early is around 82 years old. It might be smart for me to start early. That is true. Social Security, the break-even point for waiting to age 70 is 82. The break-even point for waiting until your full retirement age is more like 78. Taking it early may be a problem because I don't know if your wife works or not and has her own record, but if she is claiming on your social security record, then I think you may not want to start claiming early. Here's the money they got. They got money in the bank, uh, 45 grand checking, 70,000 in an internet bank, uh, 401k accounts, 70, uh, about a hundred grand joint account, 200,000 IRA accounts. Um, there's a bunch of money. Hold on. Uh, one and a quarter, uh, $1.3 million. Roth IRAs, miscellaneous inventions. No, no, no. We have a financial advisor who charges 0.08%. Do you sure? I bet you mean 0.8% on the IRAs in the joint account. We each put, oh, so the wife has her own 401k, so she has her own income. We are both depositing 25 grand a year into our 401k accounts. Our gross income, 135 grand. I've told my advisor to invest with medium risk, and I believe we have a good mix. Okay. He asked again, am I paying a reasonable fee at 0.08%? If it's 0.08%, then it's unbelievable. If it's 0.8, that's reasonable. Okay. Is medium risk reasonable? Sure. I've been thinking about doing Roth conversions, 40 grand each year to stay in our current tax bracket. Is this a good idea? Uh, sure. But, you know, I think it sounds like you're in great shape. The one thing you don't mention is how much you spend. And um, presuming that you run some numbers or your advisor runs some numbers, I bet you're in pretty darn good shape. Um, I think generally speaking, if, if your advisor is a good advisor and is doing some planning for you, what I would do is, number one, ask him or her that question about Social Security. Number two, make sure you run your own retirement planning numbers. And number three, I would really think twice about um, claiming at 62. I, I don't know. I, w let's see how you do. And, you know, frankly, if you can um, if your wife is going to keep working and that allows you to can maintain uh, some health insurance, even the better, right? So um, because most people who retire early, the big issue is what happens with health insurance because it's 65 for Medicare, right? So I don't know. It looks to me eyeballing this that you're in good shape, but um, we'll 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 try to dig into that social security question, and also you dig into your own numbers and see if you've got enough money to support the spending that you're doing right now. Okay, all right. It is Jill on Money, and want to remind you that we have a sister broadcast. It is called Jill on Money. It's a podcast, and you can subscribe to it on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher radio.com, Google Play, anywhere else you find your favorite podcast. Check it out. It is daily. And we love that. Okay. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you have a question about your financial life, feel free to give us a holler. It is very easy to do. All you need to do is send an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Okay, this is a long email. This is from Chad, who writes, Thanks for your show and the great information you supply for free. I figured I would submit questions that are geared a little more for your younger listeners like myself. 
who have not had a full life to amass the million dollars plus in their IRAs yet and want help for planning our future millions. Okay. Chad's 29. He says, I live in Arizona. I make 22 bucks an hour. That's 40, about $46,000 a year, not including bonuses. I graduated two years ago with a master's. For the past year, I've been working at a great company. Since you always say you need more information from other listeners, I hope you don't mind my long-winded and unorthodox way around asking questions. Okay. So he gives me his pay, his taxes. He's making a 10% contribution to a 401k with a 5% match. And he um, has is putting this money into a Roth 401k. He gets benefits, dental, medical, vision. He makes uh, contributions to a health savings account, 3.4%. Uh, Our insurance is a $1,500 deductible plan. I have a question about my HSA. Whenever I get a raise, I'm planning on upping my contributions to it because of planning for future medical costs. That sounds good to me. So he says, uh, the HSA provider was telling us that there's a loophole quote unquote, that exists now where you contribute to your HSA, you never use it to pay your medical bills and keep all receipts for 20 years. Then when you turn some age, 65, 55, or 62, you can take the 20 plus years of medical expenses you played out of pocket. Blah, blah, blah. I have no idea about that. It seems, it seems unnecessary. This is what you should do. Use your HSA for your health care. Okay, let's not do these shenanigans. It's just ridiculous. If you don't use it, it's great. Just keep that money in there. It's growing without taxes. And it's used, you can, if you leave the company in the future, you have that money to pay for medical expenses in the future when I know you're going to need them. Okay, so, all right, that's a rant. He's got 500 bucks in checking. He's got $1,000 in uh, savings and $200 in a CD. All right. So number one, back off on the whole HSA thing until you get this emergency reserve fund beefed up a little bit. He also has a Fidelity investment account of $7,000, but it's all an S&P 500 index fund. That's not a, that is not an emergency fund. So you need to have your total expenses tallied up and you need six to 12 months of your living expenses. And it's got to be in a CD, a savings, a checking, something boring. Okay. The only debt I owe is for my student loans. 12, just about $13,000 at 5%. Okay. So he says, uh, since the beginning of the year, I've been able to put uh, 30, about $3,600 towards this. Like many millennials, I live with my parents, no rent, yay, but parental roommates, no. This allows me to have excess money. I've decided to become debt free so I can start building a nest egg. Okay. So he says, I'm secure in my job. Question. Since the whole 0% interest has happened to student loans because of COVID, I've been throwing my money at my, my loan like it's on fire and it's great. It's going to pay down the principal, which he calls the embers of the fire. That's great. My mother has given me the option to buy out my loan now, and then I can pay her directly with 0% interest. Should I take advantage of that? Sure. Why not? I, I think that what you should do is essentially pay that thing, have mom pay that off and you can pay her directly. That's fine. Um, if I do take advantage of that, I can reduce my payments to only about $400. It gives me $200 that I can invest or do something else with. Any ideas? Yeah. Beef up your emergency reserve fund. I want to be financially independent, retire early because that's what all the hip kids are talking about. However, I like to live in slight luxury and travel. So I think I found a healthy mix. <laughs> Part of my strategy is to become a first-time homebuyer in Arizona. Use the first-time homebuyer down payment assistance. I'll get 5% of this covered. I want to own a home because I'm going to turn it into rental property. I'm going to live in it, blah, 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 blah. What are your thoughts on my overall circumstances and my future game plan? Thank you for taking the time to read this, if you do. If I don't hear it on the show, it's probably because it's long-winded, but I figure you could do a quick breakdown of my situation. I'm just starting to think about my financial future, and with COVID, scared a bunch, into, and with COVID, we're all scared a lot into planning for our futures. Okay. I think it sounds like you are in actually in very good shape, Chad, and I, and I like the idea that you're thinking ahead. What I want you to slow down about 
is projecting so much into the future. In other words, today, there are certain things that you need to do. We're going to get rid of that student loan. You're going to beef up your emergency reserve fund, okay? But for you to be thinking about some uh, strange use of your health saving, healthcare savings account at age 55 or 62 seems silly to me. I also would really be careful about the house because I don't know, maybe it's great, maybe it's not, but you're so young. Um, I think that it would be important for you to allow yourself the flexibility of having your money liquid, not tied up in a house. Now, I may be wrong. Maybe you'll change your mind. Maybe you do want this. But I think that that if you if possible, what I would do is one step at a time, become debt free, get your emergency reserve beefed up to 6 to 12 months of your living expenses and not and not at risk and then max out your retirement account, and then start to accumulate your down payment fund for your house. That's what I think is the sort of the general triage for this. And let's see where you are in six months. Let's see where you are in a year, and you'll let us know. And then we can kind of hold your hand and do the next phase. But that's where we are today. All right? Thanks for writing. That was a great question. And uh, if you too have a question like Chad, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. You can also go to the website, JillOnMoney.com. There, sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It is free and it is fantastic. Okay, we'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and this is the program that is walking with you as we all navigate the virus. It has been such a uh, intense time and surreal, of course. And if you've been thinking about some of your financial stuff, if you're lucky enough to have your job still, or maybe you're retired and you're rethinking how you're approaching the next group of years, we'd love to help you out that we is me and Mark. Um, and, and just do this, just send us an email, take it off of your list of things to do and do this right now. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. It's ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Okay. So Glenn writes, or this is, no, this is Susan. Susan's writing from Glenn's account. Okay. (laughs) So Susan writes, my husband and I love all caps, your podcast, and appreciate all of your frank common sense advice. Our question is regarding paying for long-term healthcare insurance. How do we determine if we have enough money to self-fund any potential long-term care needs or if we are better off purchasing long-term care insurance? If the latter, what should we look for and avoid when shopping for a policy? As members of the sandwich generation, we know how tough it can be and do not want our care to fall on our three daughters who are now just launching their careers and families. Oh boy, this is what happens. You have experience like this and it'll make you really start thinking about your own situation. So Susan's 90-year-old mother is currently paying $10,000 a month in an assisted living facility just outside of Seattle. Fortunately, she had the forethought to purchase an excellent long-term care policy which pays $8,000 $8,000 a month in perpetuity. Wow. Okay. My husband, here's the details. My husband's 59, just recently retired. Hmm. He has moderately controlled type 2 diabetes. His father died at age 66 of cancer. His mother died of eight, at age 88 of dementia. 
I'm 58. I'd like to work for another five to seven years. No major health issues other than the need to lose the quarantine weight that I've gained while working from home. My dad died at age 60 of lung cancer. My mom has been in assisted living for about a year now, but previously did live independently. Please let me know if you need additional information. Thank you in advance for your advice. Mm. Okay. So I guess there's a few things here, Susan, to consider. One is this. If you look at your current assets, what you really want to do is tally everything up and try to determine what would happen if one of us needed care. Meaning, uh, it, it's probably unlikely that you would both need care at the exact same time, but let's just, let's do it at one because let's, I'm going to make a, a sort of a general statement. Let's say you have a million bucks that's saved and a house. If one of you were to need care, then you would start eating through the million bucks. And if you were then, you know, again, if you're married, if you eat through the million bucks, the healthy spouse is left without a lot of money to survive or at least thrive in retirement. So generally speaking, and again, this really has to do with your situation, your, your unique situation. When people have net worth of say more than a million and a half or 2 million bucks, let's call it 2 million, excluding your home, then I say you probably can self-insure. If you have assets excluding your house of less than say 300 or 400, 300 grand, let's say, then I would say that, you know, you probably don't have to worry about buying insurance because you'll plow through your money and you'll qualify for government assistance but it's the people who fall in between. Let's call it 300,000 in net worth, again, outside of your house to about a million and a half or 2 million bucks. Those people, especially those who are married, may want to look into long-term care insurance. Now, here are some issues to consider with long-term care insurance. I would absolutely, if you haven't done this analysis yourself, is I would probably go and talk to somebody who is a fee only planner. If you haven't done that already to look at your retirement planning and incorporate this into your retirement planning. Now, for all I know, you've got a $10 million net worth and that's fine. But if you really feel like you're on the cusp and you're worried, then you should look at this. I'm worried a bit about your husband's ability to qualify for long-term care insurance that will be reasonable because of his underlying condition and the family history, it might be expensive. So my recommendation is this should be part of an overall retirement planning scenario that you guys go through. You take a look at it. You do it with someone who will just do the analysis, not manage your money, not do anything else. You want to have a retirement plan that incorporates long-term care into that plan to determine whether or not this makes sense for you. And, you know, if it does, then then you go, you know, in terms of long-term care insurance, then it would require you going and getting some quotes. But you'll see, and you know, that long-term care insurance is quite expensive. It's become more expensive since your mother purchased it. So I hope that helps. I thank you so much for writing. It's a great question. And that's one of the reasons that I think it's so important when people are going through these and these perspective scenarios that they look at all of retirement planning, which includes your aging plan as well. Okay. It's Jill on money. And when we return one quick little segment, and then we've got a very exciting interview today. So stay tuned. Jill on money. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And uh, remember, we are broadcasting from the Capital One Bank Virtual Studios. Capital One, this is banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? All right, let's do one quick question before we go uh, to the next hour. This is from Jill. And she writes, hi, Jill. It's Jill. 
I switched employers last year and my new employer has a 403B. I have been saving all I can for retirement since I hit age 50 last year. I currently contribute the maximum to a Roth IRA and the yearly maximum to my 403B. That's great. The match is discretionary and we're not getting a match this year. That's a bummer. I'm not sure what the matching has been like in the past. Should I continue contributing $26,000 into the 403B or am I better off putting the money into a Fidelity account? I believe they told me last year the fees were 0.36%. Maybe I didn't ask the right questions. Anyway, here's the deal. I have two accounts from previous employers. They're just sitting sitting there. One is with Fidelity. One is with Ameriprise. Okay, so a couple of issues. Number one is consolidate the two accounts, the Fidelity and the Ameriprise. Open up a new rollover account with those funds wherever you have your Roth IRA. I hope that's Fidelity. That would be great for you. And then what you should be doing is continuing to put money into the existing plan. I think that what would be helpful is get that stuff consolidated and then you can better manage the whole shebang. If you have a problem about this or you have a question, follow up with us. Okay. All right. Uh, We must go to our break. Uh, Coming up, we have a great guest. Her name is Gretchen Rubin. She created the Happiness Project. She was in the studio a while back to talk about her book, The Four Tendencies. So stay tuned. Start to clear out your mind and get ready. Gretchen Rubin is coming up right after the break. This is Jill on Money. We'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome back. It's our number two of Jill on Money, and we are broadcasting from the Policy Genius Virtual Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. All you have to do, go to policygenius.com. Well, we've got a great treat for you. We recorded this a few years back, but Mark had the idea that this would be a perfect time to actually bring this interview to you um, and, and remind you about your own personality profile. You're spending a lot of time with yourself and your loved ones. Well, we have author Gretchen Rubin. She was uh, in the studio a while back talking about the four tendencies, the personality profiles that reveal how to make your life better and other people's lives better too. Here's our interview with Gretchen Rubin. How did this project begin? Well, I was working on my book, Better Than Before, which was a book I wrote about uh, habit change, how people can make or break habits. And I was very puzzled by sort of patterns that I saw in how people did or didn't successfully change habits. And somebody said something to me that hit me like a ton of bricks. She said, the weird thing about me is that I know I would be happier if I exercised. And when I was in high school, I was on the track team and I never missed track practice. So why can't I go running now? And I thought, well, why? It's the same person, same behavior. At one time, it was effortless. Now she can't do it. What's going on? What's explaining this problem that she's having with habits? And through puzzling over that question for months and months and months and also identifying other patterns and how people responded in different situations, I discovered this framework, the four tendencies, um, which explains a lot about how people, why people do or don't do certain things. And it's about inner and outer expectations. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so exactly right. So this is about how do you respond to expectations? And we all face outer expectations, which is something like a work deadline or a request from a friend. And then we all face inner expectations, which is our own desire to keep a New Year's resolution, our own desire to get back into practicing guitar. And so how you respond to outer and inner expectations determines whether you're an upholder, a questioner, an obliger, or a rebel. 
And the largest group is the obliger, which yes. I was surprised about, actually. Yes. These are the folks who meet outer expectations, but they resist inner expectations, like your friend, the runner. Exactly. So when she had a team and a coach waiting for her, she had no trouble showing up. But then when um, she was trying to go running on her own, she stumbled. So you might see this in like a work environment where someone's really effective at work, where there's a boss and deadlines and deliverables and a team. But then when they're trying to do their side hustle on the weekends, it's like, oh, I really, really want to do it. I've been wanting to do it for years. Why am I not moving forward? It's like, okay, because that's an inner expectation and that's hard for an obliger. Let's go. So obliger, 41%. Questioner is 24%. Tell me about questioners. So questioners question all expectations. They'll do something if they think it makes sense. So they make everything an inner expectation. If it meets their inner standard, they'll meet that expectation. If it fails their inner standard, they will resist. They typically don't like anything arbitrary or inefficient or irrational. They always want to know, well, why should I? Um, And so they'll do it if they think they should. And your husband is a questioner. He is a questioner. Do you find that annoying? Well, it's funny. Um, I often do find it annoying because it's like, you know, I called him on the phone the other day and I was like, what's your work address? And he's like, why do you want to know? I'm like, can't you just tell me? Like, why are we even having this conversation? Um, But I know he's a questioner. I should have said like, hey, I'm filling out that boring form that we have to fill out. What's your work address? And then he would have told me. So but it's also it's helpful to me because questioners are really good about keeping people on track of like what makes sense because they don't they don't buy into anything that's a big waste of time or effort. Do they question what is sort of the perceived wisdom of the crowd? Because I find that that part is sort of interesting that, you know, everyone goes along, goes along, goes along. And then there's a question. It's about why are we going along? Yes. And that can be very positive and constructive in many situations because they're like, why are we doing this by Friday? Why are we using the software firm? Why am I listening to you? You know, or a questioner child would say, why am I memorizing the multiplication tables if I can just look it up on my phone? Why am I doing this? Now, it can be that in some circumstances, questioners will arrive at their own conclusions that might be very different from sort of conventional wisdom. Other people can think of them as crackpots because they're like, (laughs) well... Yeah, I mean, your team of doctors arrives at one conclusion and you, because of your you know, own research, you've decided something completely different and you think you're right, so you're going to do that. Well, sometimes other people are like, mm, you're not giving enough credit to the weight of, of, of expertise. Okay, obliger, questioner, upholder. Yeah. This is you, Gretchen. This is me. Describe to me what the upholder does. So upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. So they keep the work deadline. They meet the New Year's resolution without much fuss. Um, so these are the people who are sort of self-starters. Um, they don't need a lot of uh, supervision. They're very good at, at following through on things. So this is the kid who can always remembers to pack their backpack the night before. Um, They can be sometimes rigid um, because they really want to stick to whatever the expectations are. So sometimes they have trouble when situations are fluid or where they're expected to, you know, change plans very suddenly. Finally. Yes. The rebel. Yes. Talk about that rebel. So rebel is the smallest tendency. It's a conspicuous tendency, but it's small. And rebels are people who want who resist outer and inner expectations. They want to do what they want to do when they want to do it in their own time, in their own way. And if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. So typically they don't even want to tell themselves what to do. Like it would be unusual for a rebel to do something like sign up for a woodworking class every Saturday at 10 a.m. because they're like, I don't know what I'm going to want to do on Saturday. I don't want to have to show up someplace at 10 a.m. It would just bug them to even think that they were supposed to go someplace. Are they perpetually annoyed? In other words, the rebel, it sounds to me like the way you say that, it's it's sort of like... um like a sourpuss almost, or, mm. you know, that, that like, well, I don't want to do that. I mean, I, so I'm going to just speak personally. Yeah. Like my dad was total rebel. Oh, interesting. Total. Absolutely. Ooh. Intensely rebel. And he's, he's dead now. So we yeah. can talk about him however okay. we want. But he, so how would that show up? Like give an example. Oh, okay. Many? Okay. Let me just tell you like one of the greatest ones. Uh, my niece is getting bat mitzvahed. Okay. okay. This is whatever it was, 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And he's like, do I have to go to temple? Uh uh uh-uh, uh here we go. <laughs> uh, and I was like, what are you talking about? It's your granddaughter's bat mitzvah. He's like, I hate temple, though. I hate it. It's such baloney. And it's, uh, you know, whatever. I don't believe. I'm like, but it's Emily's bat mitzvah. Yeah. You have to show up. Ooh. Like, don't you want to pass the Torah down? Like, don't you yeah. want to do it? He, like, literally looked at me like, really? I have to do that? Uh-huh. And, you know, it drove my mother crazy. Yeah. It's hard to deal with a person like that. Yes. So that's that's my yes. experience of a rebel. It, it, I, you know, I think it is hard for the other three tendencies to sort of understand the rebel perspective. It's the smallest number of people in the rebel tendency. It's the largest chapter in the book because it's you really have to wrap your mind around it. So here's what I would have said, like, 
how do you deal with a rebel then? So one is with identity. What kind of person do you want to be? So what you could have said, knowing that he's a rebel, one thing you might have said is like, well, I always think of you as being, you know, like a considerate, loving grandfather who's really there for her. Mm. Is that your identity? Is that who you want to be? And then it's up to you to choose because you can do whatever you want. What kind of person do you want to be? Or you could, what also works with rebels is information, consequences, choice. You give them the information they need. You tell them the consequences of their action or inaction, and then you let them choose. So you might say something like, well, everybody who's the most important in the life of this child is going to be there and is going to be celebrating this moment with her. And it's a moment that she will remember for the rest of her life. Whoever's there, whoever's not there, it's going to make a big impression on her because this is like the biggest thing that's ever happened to her. Information, consequences, choice. Because saying like, you have to go, they're like, no, I don't have to go. You're not the boss of me. You can't right. make me. Right. And it's like, oh, you need, you have to take this blood pressure medication. It's the doctor's orders. I don't have to do what he says. You're not the boss of me. I'm free. So you, you kind of have to get into that rebel mindset of you choose, it's your choice, it's your freedom, it's who you want to be. We'll get back to our interview with Gretchen Rubin in just a moment. While we're on the break, don't forget, you can go to the website, jillonmoney.com. There you can check out our resource section. Lots of good stuff for you. And you can also listen to old shows that you may have missed. jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. But we also like to give you a little real life check in because, you know, your money's not the only thing that's all important, right? It's kind of. Uh, well, let me just say this. My approach to money, at least, and what I hope Mark and I do on this program is we help you take care of your financial questions so that you can then focus on what is really important. Because so often, what do we do? We take our money freakouts, our anxieties, and we kind of apply that to everything. And you know what? It, it doesn't have to be that way. So if you have a financial question, do send us an email. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Askjill at jillonmoney.com. And you can also go onto the website at jillonmoney.com. And if you're there and you're puttering around, all you need to do is uh, click the contact button. It's in the upper right-hand corner. So Part of why you're going to do that is that we're going to take care of your money issues, your financial issues, your concerns. Then you're going to concentrate on yourself. And there's a lot of examination of ourselves going on right now, which is why we are bringing back an old interview that we did with Gretchen Rubin. She is the author of a book called The Four Tendencies. So there are four tendencies upholder, obliger, rebel, questioner. And you take this quiz and you find out which tendency you are. And then Gretchen kind of breaks it down and what that explains what that means. So of course I took the quiz and of course I wanted to know everything about this. So if you want to learn about what my tendency is, check out this segment with Gretchen. So I, w I need some help with myself because okay. I want to know good. how to Let's like diagnose tip you. In, in and out. So okay. tell me about, so I took the quiz and I kind of tried to get to where I was, you know, what I was. And, um, and you know, I sort of think I know where I am. So mm. help me work through it. Okay. Wait, can I ask you a few questions? Yeah. Okay. How do you feel about New Year's resolutions? Okay. Like I can, I've done it before. You have? Yeah, sure. And if there was a sign, let's say you and I were at a coffee shop and there was a sign that said no cell phone use. And I pulled out my phone and started using my cell phone. How would, what would, what would you be thinking? I would be thinking the sign says, no, you can't do that. I feel mm -hmm. that. So that is something when it comes to manners, especially, or mm. that I'm very rigid. Mm -hmm. So do people call you rigid? Mark, am I rigid? I'm asking the producer. No, he's saying no. And if there was something that you wanted to do that was important to you, like, I don't know, whether you wanted to, like, take yoga or train for the marathon or, or something like that, um, would it be easy for you to stick to that even if nobody else cared? 
Yes, I think it would. You tell a funny story about meditation, like you did it for a long time. And so exactly a year ago, I was like, I need to meditate because Uh I've read all this research that says meditation, mindfulness, really good. And so people who've listened to this podcast have heard me say I meditate. Okay, by the way, I stopped meditating Uh like six months after because I was like, I'm exhausted. I'm trying to do it at four o'clock in the morning. It's not working for me. I haven't started up again. So I made this thing. Okay, I'm going to do Headspace every day, six months. Uh Uh-huh. Then I was like, eh, I want to sleep late. Uh Uh-huh. Later. (laughs) Huh. You're kind of coming up upholder to me. Does that ring true to you? I, I you think you sound I'm, like an upholder who tips to question. That's exactly what I thought. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that's where I went. Score. Yes. Upholder who tips to question. Right. Yes. That's kind you of. You and I are the same. That's yeah. my tendency as well. And I do tend to also ask the, I, I feel like the questioner part, I also I, like tend to question A, authority, mm-hmm. and B, conventional wisdom. Mm-hmm. So I'm always very leery of like, for example, everyone's like, oh. The Lord of the Rings is the best movie ever. And I'm like, yeah. if everyone says it, how could it be? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so one, that's not good. Well, that's... one of the things about the tendencies that's that's uh, important to keep in mind is that this is just one tiny, narrow aspect of your personality. It's how you respond to expectations. So depending on how curious you are, how intellectual you are, how adventurous you are, how considerate of other people's feelings you are, how extroverted or introverted you are, um, all these things would mix up and make a person, you know, upholders totally different. So you could be a very analytical, curious, uh, intellectual upholder. But what makes you different is that for the questioner, the, the immediate response is, why should I? Mm-hmm. Everything you're doing, why should I? And um, there's just this sort of, even if there's rules in place, like a lot of questioners are bothered by traffic regulations, which they see as arbitrary. It's like, why is everybody going 65 miles an hour? That doesn't make any sense. Or five <laughs> garments in a dressing room. Like that's totally arbitrary. You know, whereas to me as an upholder, and maybe you feel the same way, you're like, whatever, five right. garments, I get it. Like, I'm not, it's not worth my time to like noodle over why five, why not six, why not eight? You know, it's like, it's five. Okay, fine. Right. Exactly. So let's not go yeah. crazy. If I know I'm an upholder and I meet outer and I meet inner. So then I don't need quite as much help getting on the stick. But if I'm in somebody who's resisting my inner, the obliger, then I might want to seek external accountability. Absolutely. A hundred percent. But that's sort of a brilliant thing to figure out because then you could say like, I can do something online. I can join a group. Once I put it out there, I'm going to be more accountable to it. And chances are more likely to actually achieve it. No, and I think of everything in the book, that's the thing that's been sort of the most helpful insight to the most people is that if you're an obliger and you're struggling to meet inner expectations, like you want to run, you want to meditate, you want to save more, you want to, uh, you know, lose weight, what you need is a system of outer accountability. And just like you said, once you know that what you need is outer accountability, there's a million ways, there's a million apps alone to help you get outer accountability. It's something that we're very familiar that a lot of people need, but some people don't really need outer account. They might benefit from it, but they don't need it in the same way. And for a rebel, outer accountability might actually be counterproductive. But if you know you're an obliger, you know that you must have outer accountability, that that's crucial. And so instead of like thinking about, oh, why can't I never take time for myself? You can spend that time and energy figuring out, okay, given that I need outer accountability, what can I do? I want to read more. I'll join a book group. Like that's simple. Once you realize that that's what is necessary. What was surprising as all this data about people are coming in? Like you get all this different information. What surprised you as you were compiling this? The thing that surprised me really is that no one's picked up on this before. I keep thinking like this. Once you know it, it's so obvious and people are so clearly falling to each one that I kept thinking like it can't be I must be missing something or like and, and I would go over you know examples after examples and I was constantly like trying to poke holes in the framework and like does it account for everything and what about this what about that um and, but sort of everything fit into the framework like for instance one of the things that was surprising to me was that Okay, so rebels don't like outer or inner expectations, but some rebels are very attracted to areas of high regulation, like the police, the military, the clergy, or large corporations with like sort of a lot of rules. And this seemed very paradoxical to me. And I was like, well, maybe this means my framework doesn't work. But then when I talked to rebels, it was like they they understood that about themselves. And they would say like, I need to be in a place with a lot of regulation because otherwise I just sort of stall out. I need something to push against. I need somebody to give me rules that I can resist. And that's like me pushing off the side of the swimming pool. If I were just like out on my own, some rebels thrive in that like they want to be entrepreneurs or they want to be salespeople who are out on the road every day doing their own things but some people like they need structure in order to have the energy to resist and so it did fit within the framework but you know so I was constantly looking like was this is this an exception does this not fit and and slowly everything kind of fit into the puzzle you become 
a clerk for Sandra Day O'Connor. Yes. I guess I'm wondering, as you think about it, like when you go back, like, is it surprising that you said you didn't just stay in that channel, I guess? Well, you know, I think this is one of the places where being an upholder really came to my help because so, you know, for a long time, I didn't know that I wanted to be a writer, just didn't know. And so I just went to law school like so many people do. You know, it's a great education. It'll keep my options open. I can always change my mind later. It's great preparation. I'm good at research and writing. So I went to law school. But then at a certain point, actually, while I was clerking for Justice O'Connor, I got seized with this idea that I wanted to turn into a book. And what helped about being an upholder was, so upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. So I had all the outer expectations of sort of my work and my career. But then once I had the inner expectation, like I want to be a writer, I literally went to a bookstore and got a book called something like How to Write and Sell Your Nonfiction Book Proposal and followed the instructions. And some people said to me, well, how did you do that? Where you had, you had nobody looking over your shoulder you had no you know you had no idea if it would work and i'm like but for an upholder that kind of thing comes easily because it's like well i just here's the plan i'm going to execute i don't need somebody looking over my shoulder or telling me like oh this is due by the end of the month because it's just like i can do that for myself that's one of the great strengths of being an upholder we'll get back to our interview with gretchen rubin in just a minute Hey, you know what you could do during the break? You could go and subscribe to our podcast. It's a daily podcast. It's called Jill on Money. You can get it on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Radio.com, Google Play, wherever you find your favorite podcast. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are talking to a great guest, Gretchen Rubin. This is an interview that we did a few years back after Gretchen wrote her book called The Four Tendencies. And in this part of the interview, what we're focusing on is how exactly you should be talking to people who may not exactly want to hear what you have to say. How do you break through? And I think understanding these tendencies does give you a lot of tools to better communicate with people in your own life, in your real life, your personal life but also at work. Here's more of our interview with Gretchen Rubin. Okay, so I need your help on something, ready? Oh, okay. Um, so one of my cousins mm. is really highfalutin engineer type. Okay. And he says to me, uh, he said, could you look at my 401k? Mm -hmm. And I said, sure. And he's, you know, in his 50s, and it's all in cash. Mm. And I said, hmm. Mark's yeah. shaking his head. And I was like, really? What? I said, now what? What's going on here? Uh huh. And he goes, Well, I'm very nervous. I don't like the stock market. Okay. I said, Okay. He's very risk averse. He's risk averse, but his but when I kept digging, he said, No one can prove to me <gasps> that the market will go up. I said, Well, yeah. we know Ooh, okay. over the past uh, blank years, yes. this is what has happened. He goes, But you can't tell me what's going to happen tomorrow right. or for the next month or yes. the next 10 years. Like, what if we go into a 20 year depression? Yes. But it, nothing broke through. Yeah. I didn't know what to do with it. I think he's probably a questioner. Do you think he's a questioner? He's a high questioner. Okay. And yeah. I felt like there was no assuaging that fear. Right, right. Well, because he's also just like, there's. you can't show me the data. Right. And he's right, because no one can predict the future. So, you know, objectively, what he says is true, because you're saying, I'm just based on, you know, what's the... what's the Past performance yeah, is no yeah, indication yeah, yeah, of future yeah, yeah, yeah. results. Right, right, right. And you're kind of saying, ah, well, I kind of do think the past, we can predict the future from the past. Um, I mean, I think, in that, and this may be where I was saying, it's a harsh word to say, but crackpot, but this can be where questioners... Oh, total crackpot, can I look, agree. They can kind of form their own decisions. So what I would say is I would really emphasize to him your reasons and your justification for why you think. And you could say, you know, and like try to show him data that would that would do it. Now, another thing that really appeals to questioners is customization. They like to think that they're doing something that's in the way that's most efficient for them. And they also often like to experiment on themselves to get more information. So they're kind of like the kind of um, like life hacker types. 
Um, so what you might say is like, I understand what you're saying. And of course, you're right, because we can't know the future. But what if as an experiment, we took a certain amount of money that you felt comfortable with, and we decided to do something else with it and so, in a level that you felt like you could handle just to see what would happen. And let's do this in the way that's right for you and your outlook and your beliefs. So it's the idea of customization and then experimentation. Because if we do this experiment for a couple of years, that might change your mind because you're going to see, you're going to have new information coming in. So customization. I love that. Yeah. Another thing that can happen to questioners, um, it's, I mean, he's got you as a guide, so that's good. But they can sometimes fall into analysis paralysis. Totally. Yes, where they, they want more and more and more perfect information and they can't make a decision or move forward because they just want more information. And this can make them stall out. And one of the things that can sometimes help is trusted authority. Like, oh, I'm going to look up consumer reports or I'm going to, you know, oh, my cousin is like a well-respected financial expert. But sometimes they won't accept someone's expertise. And so in which case it really has to go to that, like, let me give you all the information because you have to be the best judge for yourself. I feel like on this program we get that sometimes where people will call in because we do we do callers. We have yeah, listeners sure. who call in yeah. and ask for financial advice and I'm a certified financial planner so I can yeah. like throw that hat on and do it. But uh, Mark will tell you that sometimes we'll get people who say like, well, I've been trying to convince my wife of this, but she doesn't believe me. But if I call you and I play this yes. back to her, yes. then she will believe you. Because you're a trusted authority. Exactly. That's exactly right. It's um, so interesting. Yeah. And so part of it is like, who who is, and that's like for a doctor, I need to know that you're my trusted authority. I have a friend who like interviewed five pediatric surgeons because she's like, I have to have somebody that I really believe in or I'm not going to do what he says. I think it's very interesting to consider that there are some some blind spots that each of the tendencies yes, yes. have. They all have great strengths, but also weaknesses. And and I, I think you talk about how there's this idea that if you're if you are so not just rigid, but if you're paying attention to these these external messages and you're being like the good boy, the good girl, that you can rebel against that. Yes. What does that look like? Okay, so yeah, what you're talking about is obliger rebellion, which is a very common pattern. So this is so obligers readily meet outer expectations and they struggle to meet inner expectations. So one thing that can happen is they will be meeting, 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 meeting expectations, and then suddenly they just snap, and they're like, okay, this I will not do. And, you know, and, and they put their foot down, and sometimes it's small and symbolic. Um, like, I'm just not going to answer your emails for two weeks. Or sometimes it's huge. Like, I'm going to quit this job and go work for a competitor. Yeah, I'm going to go have an affair. I'm going to go have an affair. I'm going to divorce you. I'm going to break, break up a 20-year friendship. You're dead to me. I'm over. There's nothing that you can say or do to fix this. Now, obliger rebellion is really meant to protect an obliger because it happens when an obliger feels exploited, taken advantage of, neglected, not hurt, or where burdens have just become so high that, that the, the obliger can't take it anymore. So it's meant to protect them by sort of blowing up the situation. And sometimes it can be good. So sometimes it does have a good effect, but sometimes it really can be very destructive because it's not controlled. It's an explosion. And obligers themselves will often say that they're acting out of character. And there can be reputational risks because to people around you, it's like, well, if you didn't want to do it, why did you say you would do it? Or where is this coming from? You never said anything about this before. And so people like feel very puzzled and frustrated by the behavior. So one of the things that obligers can do is to watch out for this feeling of deep resentment and burnout that's building. Mm. Like, it's too much. It's too much. It's too much. It's, you know, why do they keep pushing this on me? And try to avoid it. Or if you're somebody around an obliger, like, let's say you're in a work situation, you could say to yourself, hey, there's a lot of unpleasant work travel. Is everybody partaking in that equally or are a couple of people picking up way more than their share? Or is there somebody are there a couple of people who are taking all the extra shifts? Or is there somebody who's on every committee and every team and then other people who really are, are only doing the interesting stuff? And or or maybe you haven't taken vacation in 18 months. And I'm going to say to you, hey, I want you to come in at the end of the week and tell me when you're going to take vacation because you're too important. We don't want you to burn out. We don't want you to lose you. So you as a team member or as a boss need to say, or, you know, or as a spouse or as a friend, you need to say, this is too much. Too much is being asked of you. Let's, let's figure out how you can get outer accountability for meeting an inner expectation of giving yourself a break or pushing back. We'll get back to our interview with Gretchen Rubin in just a moment. Hey, you know what you could do during the break? You can go to JillOnMoney.com and there sign up for our free weekly newsletter, JillOnMoney.com. That's the website. We'll be right back.
401ks, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life and also tries to provide some cool interviews, fun ways to think about your own life. And today we are broadcasting an interview that we conducted a few years ago with Gretchen Rubin. Now, by the way, the book that we are talking about in this particular interview is called The Four Tendencies, but Gretchen has a bunch of other books. In fact, she has a brand new book that's out uh, that's called Outer Order, Inner Calm. And the subtitle is Declutter and Organize to Make More Room for Happiness. Mark has now decided to call this Marie Kondo, Your Life, Your Real Life. Um, It's hard to remain calm inside and outside amid a pandemic. So this is a tall ask, I think. But that said, maybe given that we are where we are, these are the, you know, it's, it's a pretty crazy time, that you have some more time with yourself, that you have some of these walks. And, you know, a lot of you are emailing me that you're taking walks with your your kids, your dogs, yourself, that you are more contemplative. Maybe, maybe this is exactly the time to have these kinds of conversations and to be a little bit more thoughtful, at least if you have the ability to do so. And I think that Gretchen Rubin can help you with that. So we, in this next and last segment, we're going to talk about one of the four tendencies. This is the upholder. And, you know, what's uh, important about the upholder is going to become apparent. But if you end up buying this book or you just want to go take the quiz, you can actually go to GretchenRubin.com and you can take the four tendencies quiz to find out if you are an upholder, a questioner, an obliger, or a rebel. All right. Okay. Here's the end of our interview with Gretchen Rubin. All right. So questioner, you can get analysis paralysis. Yes. So you can seem like a crackpot. Yeah. Obliger, you can like snap and yes. be like, ah, yeah. no yeah. one appreciates me. Yes. Rebel's obvious. What about upholder? So upholders um, can suffer tightening, which is when the rules get tighter. So a friend of mine who's an upholder, his his girlfriend wanted him to use this budgeting app, which had really helped her. Um, Because as I'm sure, you know, as you've talked about many times, if you monitor what you spend, people do a better job. And he's like, no, I can't do that because I, I know myself and I would become so obsessed with tracking every single penny on this app. It would just consume my whole life. That's tightening. It's like the rules just get tighter and tighter and tighter until a, 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 an upholder can become a faceless bureaucrat doing their own paperwork. So when I was back in college, I, yep. I stopped playing sports. I gained weight. And mm-hmm. I went to Weight Watchers, mm. and I was so good at Weight Watchers. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh my God. First of all, way back when, 100 years ago, you used to write down every single thing yes. you ate. Monitoring. Monitoring. Yes. But I also couldn't quite figure out how to stop dieting. Not that I was like That's anorexic. That's tightening. There you go. So right? you are an upholder. So, yes. so you... I really couldn't, like I literally said to the person, like I don't like I don't trust myself. I'm kind of scared. I don't want to gain the weight back. And like how do I do this? Yeah. It was hard. That was actually harder than losing the weight Yeah. for me. Yeah. It's like it's like okay, well, we're going to do this thing called maintenance. You're yes. going to add things yes. back. Yes, I got no. so super. I get like crazed. No, that's exactly tightening. Or like I've heard of like physical therapists who say, "Oh, I told my client to do this exercise once a day, and then come to find out he was doing it three times a day, thinking like, oh, well, if once is great, three times is better.' That's tightening. And so this is something that upholders really want to mindfully control. How about um, the fact that I can, no, let's talk about me because really let's it's like a therapy, about you. therapy session. I love it. This is my favorite thing to do. I okay. know. And you're an upholder. There aren't that many upholders. I don't get to hang All out right. with an upholder. For... So here's our motto. Because yeah. one of my favorite things is the mottos. Yeah. So does this ring true for you? Discipline is my freedom. <laughs> Wait a second. Um, hold on a second. I have to see if I can find something here that will oh. prove to you that I have that. But uh, right. I'll, I'll my lists. Like okay. insanity. I'm yeah. insane. And yeah. I have to write them down. Yeah. By the way, somehow or other, on an index card, putting that oh, list. Index cards is a sign of upholders. I don't really? know. what. Well, it's just anecdata, but it seems like they come up a lot. Just like Excel spreadsheets come up a lot. There we, okay. <laughs> so she is showing me... 
a like multi element. It's an oversized. This is not just your average. I have a lot card. going on. This is not even five by seven. This is this is like a five by seven. I think. Yeah. So it's not a four by six or a three by five. Right. There's underlining. There's brackets. There's exclamation points. There's multiple colors. Are the colors coded or it was just not a always? Pen? It's just a different pen and the different morning. So so it was like it's like my CBS life, my 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 life there for my column, my yes. the blog post, the yep. what do I need to do for the. It's I got to read Gretchen's book. It's, I got it right. I got to do it's that. And dates, then, it's and the, phone numbers. Right? It's, it's like, and this is like personal yeah. side on the right. Yeah. But insanity. There you go. Right. Okay. It's, yes. It's insanity. But it's great. But I so, love it. But so again, this is one of the things though. Is if you were surrounded by people who were like, you're too rigid. You need to like be looser. You're too hard on yourself. You need to get rid of this. You need to do it on an app. Like, why are you doing on a hard car? It's like, you're like, hey, this is who I am. There's a lot of people like me. There's a lot of people like you. It's not that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. The, the thing is, how do we find a system that works for each of us? And if we have to work together, how do we figure out a way that's going to work for everyone? Instead of like getting into this thing where this is the best way. This is what you should be able to do. If you respected me, you should do what I want without asking me. And I'm like... No, I'm a questioner. I'm just, I want to know why. I'm not disrespecting you. I'm not questioning your authority. I just want to have an explanation. I don't have to take that personally. Well, thanks so much to Gretchen Rubin. That was fantastic. You can check out her stuff on her website, and we'll have links in our show notes. Before we finish up for the day, maybe one more question, okay? Hang in there. It's Jill on Money. We'll be right back. are back. It's Jill on Money, and we are broadcasting from the Policy Genius Virtual Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. Just go to policygenius.com. Let's get to one more question before we call it a day. So this is from Judy, who writes, when having accounts in money market savings and CDs in the same bank in a trust account, how much money does the FDIC insure? Ah, that's a great question. Uh, so, Judy, if it's one account, one trust account, then it's $250,000 for that whole trust. I will caution you, before you start yanking your money out and moving things around, um, let's be smart about this because if you had, you know, a million dollars in there, uh, maybe what you could do is open up a couple of accounts with other folks, but maybe it doesn't make sense because I don't know how, how much you really fear your bank's failure. So if you would like, just follow up with me and tell me how much money is total in the account. Do you have a brokerage account as well? Because perhaps what might make sense is to move some of the trust account from the bank into a brokerage trust account. So do follow up because if if you, there may be some other options before you start searching around to go and open up other accounts, okay? So maybe we have something existing that we can do to help you out. All right. Now, that is it for the show. And we just are so delighted that you join us every single week. I want to remind you that you can subscribe to our podcast. It's called Jill on Money. And there you can get you can get that every single day. Go to Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Radio.com, Google Play, wherever you find your favorite podcast. You can always send us an email by just going to the website, JillOnMoney.com. Click on the contact button and you'll get it. Want to remind everybody, please, please, please to wash your hands and wear your masks and maintain your physical distancing. And please just try to do something nice for somebody else today. Thanks again for listening. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Telercio is our executive producer, and we'll talk to you next week.